Yo ho, my name is Tony. You may think this is a curious choice, but there's a reason for it. Well, several in fact. Good old Hammer Studios like to mix things up a bit. As well as their horror, thriller, sci-fi fare, they also ran a nice little sideline in swashbuckling action adventures. You know, boys own stuff taking cues from the likes of those bracing old school Hollywood epics like the adventures of Robin Hood, Captain Blood and the Seahawk. Naturally, theirs were more bargain-budgeted affairs, utilising a house roster of actors, writers, composers, cinematographers and directors, but buffed up with their signature style, the one that makes El Cheapo Productions look, feel and sound much more enriched and voluptuous than they were. They went out of their way to make sure that although these films were full-blooded enough and grisly in places, they swerved or toned down the blood, scares and sex so that they could snag U or A certificates from the BBS. FC and thus broaden their audience appeal. They were released during the school holidays to cash in. Yep, Hammer made some movies kids could go and see. Wholesome fun for all the family, folks. But as you would expect this being Hammer, they pushed the boundaries a bit here and there, yet for the most part exercised uncharacteristic restraint, a word they were not normally associated with. In the 60s, the Hammer Machine pumped out Swords of Sherwood Forest in 1960, Captain Clegg Night Creatures 1962, The Crimson, or depending where you live, Scarlet Blade 1963, Pirates of Blood River in 1964, The Brigand of Kandahar 1965, and a challenge for Robin Hood in 1967. Incidentally, Ollie Reed featured in four of those listed, with an uncredited part in Swords of Sherwood Forest. Just thought I'd mention it. The Devilship Pirates was released in 1964, but it wasn't until 1971 that I caught sight of a poster for it at the old Market Hall Cinema in my hometown. There it was on a double bill with a scarlet blade. Now as I've said previously, films took a while to land in the provinces, but this might seem like stretching it a bit. It was different back then, especially where I lived. Zulu from 1960 was still a big draw and still doing the rounds. Every time it turned up, once or twice a year, I wheeled out to see it, never tired of it. The 60s Bond movies kept arriving like they were on some sort of perpetual carousel. Even films that have been screened on TV popped up now and then, some visually enhanced by that scaled up big screen viewing experience. I was lucky, I was spoiled for choice. The first time I saw The Devil Ship Pirates was on the big screen, I'd recommend watching it that way. Also of all the Hammer swashbucklers, some of which the posters boasted were filmed in Hammer scope, whatever the hell that was, The Devil Ship Pirates is my favourite. Therefore, this review. In 1588, the Spanish Armada entered the English Channel. I think their dastardly plan was to take Plymouth and commandeer it as a base of operations from which to launch an invasion force into the rest of the country. Despite immense confidence and prideful arrogance, things didn't work out in Spain's favour though, and the English Navy, under the combined leadership of Sir Francis Drake, Lord Howard and Sir John Hawkins, kicked their maritime asses all over the ocean. Worst thing you can say about anything to do with the sea is, by God, this thing is unsinkable, unbeatable, indestructible. You're tempting fate and God will fuck you, trust me. My take on history is often faulty, and that being the case, I'm sure someone will set me right in due course. Just make a comment, okay? However, for the purposes of the review, that's the background against which the narrative plays out. Captain Robles, Christopher Lee, and his crew of the Diablo are limping away from a naval battle on their damaged galleon. The ship has taken a pasting, and Robles felt it was time to cut and run. The high-ranking military dog on on board didn't agree, so in the interest of self-preservation and being a practical type of guy, Robles shot him in the spine. Robles and his crew are not your average dutiful monarch-loving sailors. They're pirates who took a commission from the Spanish crown to pitch in. When it looks as if all is lost, they're quick to pitch out again. They meander their crooked way up an English estuary looking for somewhere to dock and make repairs, then slope off back to Spain like the sneaky whipped curs they are. The tide ebbs and the Diablo is deliberately run aground. They've got four days in which to fix the tub until the rise of the spring tide and they make their getaway. So, best keep a low profile then, stay undetected. They remain undetected for about five minutes. A young woman, Jane Natasha Pine, randomly turns up in a rowboat. Captured by Robley, he interrogates her 
her to discover she's from a small isolated village nearby and that all the young men are off fighting in the war. He orders Pepe, Michael Ripper, to lock her in the brig, during which the none too bright and loose lipped sailor let slip that the Armada just got a kick in in the old maracas. Robles sends Pepe along with another man and the duty obsessed military lieutenant Manuel Barry Warren to scope the place out. Pepe and his pal are, it's fair to say, fucking useless scouts. They're discovered and beaten up by Harry John Kearney, who is the son of local blacksmith Tom Andrew Keir and brother of Jane, as well as being the love interest of Angela, Susan Farmer, the daughter of the local lord of the manor Sir Basil, Ernest Clark. Harry is an ex-sailor who was once a prisoner of war in Spain, so he hates the Spanish with a fucking vengeance. He only has the use of one arm, the other hanging like a limp noodle after a sponge bath, and it's inferred that torture during his captivity activity is the cause of his disability. He can still hold his own in a fight against multiple enemies though, what a disarming chap. With Pepe and Chum lashed to a whipping post in the town square, Manuel intervenes and boldly declares that England lost the war, the Armada was victorious and the country is now under Spanish rule. Harry and his old man are suspicious, but Sir Basil has collaborators stamped right through him like Blackpool through a stick of rock. I sense some French ancestry here. Along with the local vicar, Peter Howell, Sir Basil instantly agrees to play ball with his new masters and goes merrily down the appeasement route. Sound faintly familiar, that? Robley takes immediate charge of the town, demanding that the locals fix his galleon and allowing his men to sing, fight, fuck and generally run riot. However, when Manuel, who is loyal to the Spanish king, finds that Robley has no intention of returning to Spain, instead figuring to resume piratical activities in the West Indies, he begins helping Harry and a small resistance faction. When Jane outwits her captors, none too difficult, they have shit for brains, and escapes into the marshes, they give chase. Harry is out looking for her, and confronts the two Spaniards chasing her down. He kills them both, running them through and chucking them in a bog. Carrying his unconscious sister back to the town, he is held by two pirates, man in a blockade, of the only road, in or out. There is, however, many square miles of room to go around, if you fancy the scenic route, just saying. When it looks as if they're about to be executed, Manuel appears and blows the two sentries away with his double-barreled flintlock pistol. New one on me, but I'll go with it. Jane reveals the truth to Harry and her father. Spain ain't one shit. Sir Basil is opposed to resistance in any form and rats out Tom and Harry. Clearly, he's the dick out of the three. Robley has Tom hanged and Harry flogged. Well done, Baza. The lapdog lord doggedly continues to toe the line until Robley announces that they're going to set sail, taking the young women of the village with them as hostages, including his daughter Angela. Basil briefly finds his balls again, but up against Robley, Robley's swordsmanship, he's, well, Woody Allen squaring off with Mike Tyson, and takes a well-deserved rapier through the gizzard, not before time either. Manuel assists Harry in boarding the Diablo, setting fire to it, and igniting a fuse to detonate the gunpowder magazine. They manage to get the hostages safely ashore. In a sword fight with Robley on the deck of the burning galleon, Manuel is fatally wounded. Harry steps in, but he's not faring much better, until the dying Manuel lets rip with his two-shot flintlock again, blasting Robley to death. Harry manages to get clear as the gunpowder detonates and the Diablo and her crew succumb unto a fireball of pyrotechnic death and destruction. You know, I miss the days of simple, straight-up, low-budget action adventures like this. There is no pretension, no convolution, no fat bloat or waste. Just a purity of vision, idea and execution. Jimmy Sangster's script simply tells a story with streamlined economy and narrative unfussiness. The dialogue ain't gonna worry Beckett or Pinter any, but then it's pitched at just the right level and tone for an everyman audience. Don Sharp's direction is essentially deadpan. The often great Michael Reed cinematography is in keeping with Hammer's stock approach to visuals, bright and florid, and Canadian Gary Hughes turns in a suitably generic but rousing score. Christopher Lee shines as a very precise, calculating and menacing figure, making good use of his talent for malevolent stillness, poised like a cobra just before it strikes. He always seemed very much at home with a sword in his hand, and the fights are tense and well choreographed, utilising Lee's capacity for making a very convincing fist out of his action sequences. There are also moments of dark humour that provide a chuckle or two. When the bosun, Duncan Lamont, comments on the Don who's just been shot, he's still alive. 
Lee replies without so much as missing a single beat. Lee is front and centre and gives the best performance in the film. Everyone else is pretty much character filler, some better than others. Their jobs are to populate and give structure to the story as it orbits around him. The Spaniards are the least Spanish Spaniards I've ever fucking seen. There are no accents resembling anything remotely Spanish. Michael Ripper, who appeared in 35 Hammer films, plays a character called Pepe, but uses the same Hampshire accent he used in every one of those films, whatever or whoever he was playing. Peter Cushing once joked, no matter what it was, we were all just starring in a Michael Ripper film. Beneath the surface, though, there are hints of some thought and depth relating to the subjects of warfare and invasion. As an island nation with the development of naval technology and the advancement of coastal defences, the last invasion of Britain was by the French at the time of the French Revolution in 1797. Before that, it had been the Normans in 1066. The 1797 one is often dismissed as it was a miserable failure. Fear of invasion, however, remained a nagging ghost haunting the collective national consciousness. It coalesced as a much likelier and more realistic possibility at the time of the First and Second World Wars. The Devil Ship Pirates reflect similar themes present in Alberto Cavalcanti's 1942 wartime propaganda flick Went the Day Well. Intended as a warning of the type of threat Britain was facing at the time, as well as a morale boosting flag waver, here a chocolate box rendition of a small English village community falls foul of an invading force of Nazi militia. A first wave, if you will. The military are enabled by spies and collaborators, figures enmeshed in the fabric of village life. So, be wary and suspicious of everyone, folks. Stay vigilant. That innocent-looking postmistress just might be one of Adolf's concubines. As you can imagine, the villagers will have none of it. They band together, punch, shoot, stab, beat, kill the interlopers. The film ends with one of the characters indicating the unmarked graves of the Nazis with the line, Yes. That's the only bit of England they got. The message is clear, fuck with us and we'll set right about you, Fritzy. All you'll get is lamped into a dirt bath. So it is with the Devil Ship Pirates. Robley and his men pick a fight with the wrong yokels and end up in burning smithereens all over the coastline. And their leader only had one working arm. Just goes to show you what us British are made of. We can take you with one arm hanging uselessly by our side. Will the world ever forgive the French for collaborating with the Nazis in World War II and forming the Vichy government? By 1964, Jimmy Sangster seemingly hadn't. Sir Basil, along with the representative of the church, twin icons of government and the state, the long-established order, instantly roll over and take it right up the grassy ass as collaborators with the enemy in this rapidly imposed new world order. They sell out anyone who ain't with the program. They don't even stop to think about it. A theme possibly wasted on an audience of kids, but more likely to resonate with some of their parents. Sleeping with the enemy is not a good option, it mostly ends in tears. What do we have for entertainment? Hammer had a full-size galleon constructed, parked it in a flooded sand pit, pumped out a lot of background smoke to conceal the M4 roadworks in the distance, and then set it on fire and blew it up. That's how you do it. The film nips along at pace. There are fights, swordplay, marshes, quicksand, hangings and floggings, and a romantic thread that doesn't get in the way or slow anything down. I've just rewatched the Blu-ray version, and it's quite lovely. Held my attention from beginning to end, left me feeling happily entertained and a little bit saddened that although films of this type provide the easiest of blueprints to follow, no one can seem to replicate their creative essence these days. Once upon a time, the focus was set on storytelling, providing fun and entertainment and making a buck or two. Now how difficult can it be? Not exactly quantum physics, is it? Thanks for your time and attention. If it pleases you, stick around to hit either like or didn't like, chisel a comment, swashbuckle subscribe, visit my Patreon channel where exclusive early access to content is the main thing, or help me keep in a state of functioning alcoholism by tapping the thanks button and making a much appreciated contribution to the cause. I shall return in the very near future. Farewell for now, pilgrims, and splice that fucking main brace. Arrgh!